Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I'm uh, working now on preparing uh, my next video on Romans, but I've been in the Old Testament, and so I wanted to pass something along that I feel that might be of interest to some of you. I've uh, showed you through Romans as well as Ephesians and in numerous other videos how that we are God's sheep, we are his people, and that we have returned unto the shepherd and bishop of our souls, that we were lost sheep that our Lord left the, the 99 to find the one that was lost, and that we never were goats, but that we have always belonged to him and that God remains faithful even when we are not, that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came into the world to save his people from their sins. So bear with me as we travel back in time 4,000 years to a world still in the infant stages of civilization. I want to cover quite a bit of territory, but I'll try to be brief and to the point. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, uh, that being the, uh, the city of, of uh, Ur, or Ur, and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And the Lord said unto Abram, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Genesis chapter 13. When Abraham's descendants had multiplied to the extent that they could be considered a nation, they unfortunately found themselves living lives of slavery in the land of Egypt due to famine. But the Lord saved the lives of all of his people using Jacob's son, Joseph. Second only in authority to Pharaoh himself. It wasn't long after Joseph's death, however, that the Egyptians began to fear the Jews. They were an imagined threat to Egyptian autonomy. Uh, the Egyptians began to persecute them and put them into forced labor camps. Then comes Moses and his brother Aaron. Moses and his brother Aaron, both of whom had escaped and fled from Egypt after Moses, after Moses killed a, an Egyptian in defense of one of his own countrymen. The Lord's uh, plan was to use Moses and Aaron to free his chosen people, and I'm sure a lot of you know the story. We now arrive at Mount Sinai. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a pe peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Exodus chapter 19. And what was the Jews' response? The Jews' response was, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, Exodus 19, 8. God said through Moses that if Israel would simply obey his words, then everything that was promised to Abraham in the beginning would finally be fulfilled for the entire nation. Moses explained this concept in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. Obedience would bring earthly blessings. It was conditional. And I want you to note my words, earthly and conditional. In fact, if you have a piece of paper and a, and a pen handy, uh, I'd like for you to write those two words down, earthly and conditional. At least make a mental note of that because it's important uh, as it regards where I'm going with all of this. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all of his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. 
and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. God wanted to mold them into a nation that the entire world could point to be, uh, to, could point to as an example of his goodness. Moses explained that all of his all Israel had to do. All they had to do was to continue in the way that he had instructed them, and everything that they did would turn out well. Obedience would bring God's blessings, earthly blessings. But disobedience would bring cursings. Obedience could have brought them to the borders of Palestine within two weeks, but only Caleb and Joshua were eventually allowed to enter into the promised land. The entire history of Israel has been marked by alternate periods of blessings and curses, the characteristics of which depended on the behavior of the nation. Amos tells us this in chapter 4 of Amos. He, he would stop the rain, make the crops fail, destroy their economy, cause disease to break out among the people, and ultimately allow nearby countries to become powerful enough to attack their borders. These progressive judgments led to the eventual scattering of Israel by the powerful Assyrian Empire. The book of Judges uh, contains a graphic history of the early backsliding of Israel. Back and forth, Israel time and time again would forget God, fall into evil or idolatry, and inevitably suffer the Lord's judgment. The severity of the judgment would eventually cause the people to cry out to God for forgiveness. God would hear their cries and send a deliverer, a prophet, who could lead them back to repentance. Moses predicted in Deuteronomy, The Lord uh, shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth, scattered. In many cases, the Israelites turned from the Lord so completely that they ended up worshiping idols. They built images and altars to worship them instead of God. Solomon's last-minute backsliding caused the downfall of the nation. Political infighting after Solomon's death caused a split that would never be healed. And from that time forward, the descendants of Abraham became two nations, one made up of Ten tribes to the north, which retained the name Israel, and the second consisting of two tribes uh, to the south, which went by the name of its dominant member, Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel was the worst. After Solomon, they had no king whom the Lord regarded as righteous. Every ruler seemed to be more evil than his predecessor. Still, the Lord did not give up on them, yet they continued to ignore his warnings. Moses actually saw this centuries before they occurred. Isaiah also predicted it. The northern kingdom of Israel was so entrenched in evil and idolatry that it would, it would uh, lead to the complete and total destruction at the hands of a foreign nation. The Assyrian army began to rumble toward the west, conquering everything in its path. The northern kingdom of Israel was reduced to a territory less than a third its original size. At this point, though God remained faithful, the Lord also stood against them. All the preaching of Amos, Hosea, and Isaiah went unheeded. The words of Moses written down centuries before were coming true with amazing precision. In the aftermath of these battles, Israel was reduced to a mere fraction of its former boundaries within the promised land. But because of Hezekiah's faith, the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrians, causing the rest of them to return home on the basis of a rumor. After the death of Hezekiah, his son Manasseh reigned, but instead of continuing in his father's footsteps, he chose to become the most notorious and evil king in all of Judah's history. The next generation became more evil. 
Manasseh had taken Israel into such depths of unbelief and sin that the Lord now said that no acts of righteousness afterward would make any difference. Even Josiah couldn't turn the hearts of people around enough to prevent the coming of the Lord's judgment. And inner Ezekiel, who was destined to become the Lord's prophet to a captured and defeated Judah in Babylon. The Lord continually kept a remnant of Jewish believers safe from harm. There were always some who retained a true faith in God and refused to do evil. For decades, Ezekiel and Jeremiah preached to a rebellious nation that wouldn't listen. It was not the Assyrians this time, but the Babylonians under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar that now threatened the land. Babylon was now free to enter Palestine and all of the countries to the west, including the small nation of Judah. In the summer of 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar took captive the leaders of the people, as well as the most promising young men, to prevent the possibility of future rebellion. The prophet Daniel was among the first of those captives taken to Babylon. His is a story which proves that the grace of God is real even in the darkest of hours. Daniel's witness to Nebuchadnezzar made clear that a higher power was really in control. Judah ignored its prophet Jeremiah and sought to purchase weapons of, uh, from Egypt rather than seeking protection from the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar had no choice but to attack again. The prophet Ezekiel was taken, held captive in Babylon, though most of the nation was now scattered away from the promised land. The Lord still had every segment of the Jewish population covered by a prophet, Ezekiel among the captives in Babylon, Daniel in the very court of Nebuchadnezzar, and Jeremiah remaining in Israel. Yet for all practical purposes, the country of Israel no longer existed. Once the destruction of Israel began, it seemed inevitable to go on uh, to completion. When the last king of Judah, Zedekiah, once again rebelled against Babylon, by refusing to pay tribute, the assembled armies of the Babylonian Empire began to march toward Palestine for the third and final time. Two years later, in 587 BC, after an extended siege by the Babylonian army, the walls were breached and the city of, of Jerusalem was sacked and the temple was completely destroyed, just as Jeremiah and Ezekiel had predicted. The people of Judah who survived the attack were led away captive in, in mass to live lives of slavery in Babylon. In spite of the sin brought judgment, God allowed the faithful and repentant to return to Israel exactly 70 years later. But things would never be the same as they were during King David's reign. From the moment of the first Babylonian attack, the nation of Israel was destined to become subservient to every major empire that arose in the region. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans would take turns controlling the land, the only exception being the relatively brief period of semi-independence as a result of the Maccabean Revolt in the middle of the second century BC. In 63 BC, the Roman army successfully battled their way to the gates of Jerusalem. And by the time Jesus arrived on the scene, Roman control had been firmly established in the land by Herod the Great. Many were hoping that the Messiah would immediately free them from Roman rule and set up the kingdom of God. That wasn't going to happen. The final scattering of Israel was about to take place, and it would be predicted by Jesus himself. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them who are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Matthew chapter 23. 
God Almighty was literally and figuratively leaving his holy temple to inhabit a new temple, the body of Christ. That is us, the church, you and me. As Jesus departed from the temple, his disciples sought to appease the tense situation by showing him the beautiful buildings of the surrounding area. Instead, Jesus responded with these somber words. See ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Matthew chapter 24. And when did Jesus say all of this would occur? He tells us plainly in Matthew. Matthew chapter 23. 23 Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. The Jewish rebellion was finally put to an end in a mass suicide among a few holdouts in Masada three years later. Anti-Semitism has reared its ugly head in every generation, and recent history can claim no exception. The fulfillment of Moses' prophecy was found among the dead in the German concentration camps of World War II. The horrible atrocities that occurred under Hitler's reign stand as a testament to biblical prophecy and the truth of Moses' words. The blood of over six million Jews cries out as proof to the sad truth of biblical prophecy. While God desired to bless them beyond imagination, sadly Israel brought the curse upon their own heads because of their continued rejection of the love of God and his Christ. God set Israel aside in unbelief. The Bible says that they shall remain in this state until the day that they repent and turn to Jesus in faith and truth. He also promised, prophesied of a future regathering of Israel, which would happen at the end of the age. We, we know this to be the rebirth of Israel in 1948. In the book of Jeremiah, these words can be found. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Jeremiah chapter 30. Isaiah had much to say about Israel's future rebirth as a nation. In chapter 43 of Isaiah, the Lord says that no matter how far away his people may be scattered, he will still be able to bring them back. God brings back his people from where they are scattered. You can write that down if you want to. Take a note of that. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that is called by my name. Ezekiel also prophesied of the day that Israel would re return. He, he likened them to a wandering flock of sheep that had strayed away from their shepherd. And the same is true of his people, the church. Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. I will seek them out as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them to their own land. Ezekiel chapter 34. How can anything be stated more clearly? And now here we are, the church, where God has reversed the entire process of obedience brings blessings, disobedience brings curses, that's old covenant, earthly, to a people comprised of Jew and Gentile both, who are obedient, not so that they might be blessed, but because they have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. God says, I will reverse the process. They shall obey me because they have been blessed, except in their case, with spiritual blessings, not earthly. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. The world is not our home. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ 
all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And yet, despite this reversal from law to grace, the religious system has become, for the most part, just as Israel was, trying to appease God under the same old covenant blessing and covenant program that they failed to uphold, uphold that Israel failed to uphold. But with the same view in mind, earthly, not heavenly, law instead of grace, whereas Israel ignored the law, the church ignores God's grace. All the law ever did was condemn and show our sinfulness. And by believing it must succeed where Israel failed, it is blind to the very fact that it is God who is faithful toward his people despite their unbelief, that it is God who seeks and saves that which is lost, the sheep of his pasture, that no man seeks after God, but that all have gone astray and together have all become useless and unprofitable. While the covenant has changed from old to new, man's heart and attitude toward a gracious, loving God has not. The idols it worships may be different, but they are nevertheless still idols. Christians, by the millions today, wander in a new kind of wilderness, where that they fail to enter into God's blessings because they fail to trust Him as their God, where that they enter into His rest, ceasing from their own works as God did from His after creating for six days, overcome by its own powerful and conquering enemy, which is the flesh or that it too fails to listen to the warnings given by men God chose to bring her out of darkness into light and to warn of the destruction that is to come not upon her this time. Oh no, not upon her, but upon those who do not know Christ. The lesson is that only God remains faithful. Man has not changed because he cannot of himself bring about that required change. He is still traveling down the same road and unless God intervenes, he will always continue to do so. Even the word of God concerning the kingdom age teaches us that even after a thousand years of global peace and prosperity under Christ's rule and reign, without war, at the end of that thousand years, mankind will attempt to overthrow God's rule on earth. I pray you all get the intended point of my having said all of this. It is solely by God's grace and His faithfulness that He redeems His people. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.